Twelve time Emmy nominee Neil Patrick Harris joins us today. I'm Chris Beecham, managing editor of Gold Derby. This is Zach Laws, also co hosting, contributing editor for Gold Derby. Neil, I, I wanted to ask you to open up with 12 Emmy nominations in just over a decade. You've won five, so you're basically almost 50 50 because we don't know what the 12th one's going to be yet. <laughs> uh, take us back over that time, maybe to your first one, especially, and, and give us uh, what that meant to you to get that first one. If I'm not mistaken, the first nomination was for, was that the first Tony Awards that I hosted? I was looking the, um, I think you had three in a row before Tony's for How I Met Your Mother. Oh, for How I Met Your Mother. And then the Tony's and Glee kicked in. And... You're absolutely right. Yeah, How I Met Your Mother was such a, was such a fantastic beast because we, for a long period of time, um, didn't get much recognition we're on the bubble was a show that was was not super well received and it was only in year four i think once syndication was uh was probable that people started to watch it in earnest and then i guess since it was on sometimes during the days it sort of took off and got its own momentum so uh so getting like recognition in the awards uh sector was super fun a bit surprising and you know the the, the drawback is it was all the same years as entourage which was an award show darling <laughs> so uh no it's fun i mean i i'm i'm very um i'm very appreciative when shows and uh work that i've done and have been on uh are acknowledged, but having been on both sides of that award show um, gauntlet, meaning I've been in the producerial position and the host position, um, there's a certain level of zeitgeist arbitrariness that is that is part of it. So I think, especially given the years that we are in now, there are so many good, amazing work being done by so many people on so many levels that to, you know, single a few out is awesome. Um, but it really is a different world now, right? Well, speaking of uh, peak TV, uh, a series of unfortunate events, uh, this was the last season of that show. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you've been through this before, saying goodbye to shows like How I Met Your Mother, for instance. Um, but what was special about this one? Talk a little bit about uh, wrapping this series up uh, with this third season. So a series of unfortunate events to me was uh, something that was pitched to me by Barry Sonnenfeld and by Team Netflix as a larger piece of art. Um, the idea was always just three seasons because the three seasons covered the 13 books that Daniel Handler wrote of the Lemony Snickets uh, and the series uh, as a book. And we were trying to be very loyal um, with embellishment, but very loyal to the source material. So when it was pitched to me, do you want to go to Vancouver and wear two and a half hours of prosthetics every day and, uh, and do some, some heavy lifting acting um, of a really grand scale? It was always pitched to me as something that was finite. And so I loved that because it felt like we were doing a thing instead of trying to do something and just fingers crossed we get to do it again and again and again. Um, it gave us a sense of purpose. And so wrapping it up was good. Um, it, there was no sort of bitter sweetness to it. I was, I was so pleased, almost, almost like I have never felt before. I was so pleased with the level of work that everyone put into this Netflix show that, you know, kids are able to like and watch and appreciate uh, on an artistic scale that um that has never had never been done before and so when i said goodbye to it i was a tired um but b just so um happy with the, how the work turned out one of the things i love about your character of count olaf is that you know he's kind of the the sort of character that somebody like Peter Sellers or Alec Guinness would have played uh, in one of their movies because, you know, he, he has all these different personas and, and costume changes and things that he does. Was that part of the appeal? I mean, can you talk a bit about, uh, in a sense, not just playing a character, but being able to play a character, playing multiple characters? 
Yeah, it was relatively meta. I, I had not read the books before any of this happened. So when it all uh, was coming to me as an opportunity, it was uh, cool, but I quickly read the first book and, uh, and there was no real disguise in the first book. And then I read the script that was in line with the first book and I just loved the tone. And I had never done that kind of that kind of performance before. I'm speaking much more like um, technically. I had done multi-camera work, and I had done theater, and I had done stuff. I'd never done the full-on prosthetic uh, face by way of Barry Sonnenfeld, which is really specific angles and wide, locked-off shots and lots of peering in and looking at stuff. And the combination of that seemed intriguing to me just as a challenge. Then I started reading the books and quickly realized that it was now I'm, <laughs> now I have a beard and uh, no hair and glasses and I have to come up with a funny voice and now I'm playing a one-legged sea captain with an eye patch and uh, a terrible accent and fake teeth and that was uh, yes it turned into very uh, Peter Sellers very very quickly and meta in a fun way it was challenging for me personally because I probably overthought it. But again, with with this kind of material, I have I wanted it to be as complex as possible, given that it was based on books that are complex in nature, but are more Grimm's fairy tale than uh, than anything, right? Dark stories that don't end well, um, but playing a a broad, wily coyote kind of guy who was playing, who was a terrible actor, who was playing roles that were believable by adults but not by the kids, and funny enough that you kind of laughed at them but not so ridiculous that anyone would see through them, was for me, uh, a, a, you know, a challenge in insecure ways, as you can imagine. <laughs> One of our editors, Marcus, had a good suggestion for me to ask you this morning, yeah. which is um, we want to challenge you to come to the Creative Arts Emmys as Count Olaf. Oh, my gosh. You would be the head I, of the red carpet. Could you imagine? That would be so, it would be so fun to do a car. Or, or since you play different characters, really, you know, different looks, just keep circling the red carpet and changing looks. <laughs> do it three or four times. The be like a big is trick for you. The carpet is such an interesting vibe because you have to always be kind of smiling and present presentational because you're never sure who's watching and what's happening. Uh, it would be really fun to do a carpet where you were, I was fully uh, some other character because I could really go whole hog in the physical comedy. That would be fun. That would be fun. I'd rather be photographed looking very uh, rakish and, and, and charming though. Right? <laughs> You've got the Clark Gable look going on today. I'm making a movie in uh, in Montreal, uh, feature film called Spinning Gold, and I'm playing a guy named Bill O'Coin, who was uh, the manager for the rock band Kiss. And I've been doing that for a few months. So yes, I have a summer stash. <laughs> I wanted to ask you. You might be the best person in the world to ask this question. You're the only person to ever host all four major award shows. You've got the egot of hosting. Um, what do you think about this current trend this year of no hosts? Yeah, I think there's something to be said for no hosts. You certainly allow more time to spend on other things, right? On on honoring the material. I think award shows are are a, a tricky dynamic, and it's a hard one to produce. And the um, the Emmys are especially hard because the level of of television has expanded so much that there's so much good content, and it's so varied. Um, and you have so much talent and you have streaming and you have network and you have cable. There's just so many options that it's kind of hard to rein everyone into a singular show. So it's almost, it's almost, uh, it's almost like looking at the whole year through a very fast forward <laughs> speed, uh, on your, on your TV. So it's a, it's a woman's job and a difficult one for anyone. Um, and you know, you just try to, at least when I was doing it, you try to make choices that are honoring the season's material. So if it was a season of hit comedies, then you can be funnier in the show and more irreverent. If the, if it's more 
drama and breaking bad and games of thrones and things then you probably would want to be more serious and 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 honored in that way now there's so much so much so much i don't even know where they're going to go with it but it's cool it's cool i think to see behind the curtain a little bit and to appreciate how these things are made so i i'm most excited as an audience member watching award shows when i get to see sort of the inner workings of things more than just um dresses and speeches another question i had on a different topic uh in the last year we lost Stephen bochco who you know helped introduce you to the world really um so i wonder what your maybe a favorite recollection of his for you and also what what did he do between hill street blues and la law and doogie hauser and nypd blue and all those great television shows what was he doing that that caught on and became you know made him so iconic wow well that's such an that's such a twofold question and so interesting and i would want to word myself so particularly because i have nothing but wonderful things to say about him and memories of him he championed me um he actively changed my life uh i think he revolutionized television uh brought the single camera ensemble show of hill street blues um to a, a level of quality and accessibility and um and character development in a way that hadn't been done before obviously it, it received a lot of accolades for just that la law was a massive success it was also i mean it sort of changed television as well my parents uh were both attorneys so we were avid fans they were avid fans of that show and so when i had started working in from small town ruidoso new mexico here and there on certain weird things i got to do a movie with whoopi goldberg which was really random called clara's heart and i was doing a couple of random things it wasn't my life's calling the question was did you ever want to do tv and we said no as a family because it would uproot us to california and my parents jokingly said unless it was written by you know like the guy that did la law or something or <laughs> and so you know cut to i don't know how many years after we, they said that but sure enough uh, a script comes along that's that's just like it was just perfectly designed for for an opportunity to do to again change the game i mean it was a half hour single camera show very much a dramedy that wasn't done at, at those times it was coupled with the wonder years which itself was kind of a revolutionary show and it allowed me to spend four years of my life learning skills from people whose whose craft mattered a lot and whose um you know the visual aesthetic was important the dialogue was not to be played with um the, the the responsibility at 16 years old looking younger uh was a lot but i've always kind of been turned on by a voracious challenge and so to get to be an actor as a child is is a, a very jarring experience um oftentimes you're on a sitcom where there's crowds of people who are being caffeinated and are supposed to laugh at everything you say and there's producers and and other people who just yes everything that you ask for i didn't have that experience you know my my experience with that was was a lot of work we had i had to learn medical jargon i had to learn medical procedures i had three hours of school a day and i had a heavy day of work and that i learned how shots worked how steady cams worked i learned how to be efficient effective how not to wander how to be focused and i can attribute all of that uh to stephen bochco and his belief in me someone who had not done much before that you you certainly see his influence uh on television today uh, certainly from a quality standpoint i mean one of the things that i love about watching a series of unfortunate events is uh the the attention to detail in the sets and in the costumes uh, so I wonder, as an actor, how does that help put you into the world and, and help put you into the character? You know, this, these incredible sets and, and costumes for this show. 
it was so fantastical in every way, right? And I just assumed that if you were going to do something like this, with this kind of scope and scale, that most of it would be done uh, as an after effect uh, digitally. And then along comes Barry Sonnenfeld, who directs while sitting on, uh, you know, a horse, uh, what's that thing called? A saddle? Yeah, he sits on a saddle <laughs> with a cowboy hat and he, and he pontificates and he, and he has such a great eye and he wanted everything to be very real. So we filmed it in Vancouver where it, every, every single thing with maybe three or four sh single shot exceptions were in sound stages and the sound stages were giant sound stages and everything. Bo Walsh's uh, production design was outrageous on any feature film level. And it and and every book was two episodes, and they built the entirety of these sets, an entire sea town, an entire hotel wing, an entire uh, you know labyrinth hedge maze, and all of these things weren't done digitally. So it made it a very fun sandbox to play in, but almost it was just a fantastic gift, right? Because I had prosthetic makeup on, everyone was in costumes by you know cynthia summers did these outrageous things just day after day and we were in the real sets it was like you had been transformed into an entire world and one of my favorite things to do was welcome people who were visiting onto the sets because you'd pull up into just this regular old area and you'd walk through these doors and you were in you know a it was old time movie magic you were in a forest you were in these crazy places and you could walk through them. A submarine, like the entire two submarines were on sound stages. It wasn't a single wall. They built it for a wall. I still don't know how they got permission to do it. Um, and I don't know where all of those things went. They should open up some sort of museum. But um, it's one of the reasons that I'm actually very grateful that you guys are allowing me to talk about the show. Because I think sometimes the children's programming uh, category could get overlooked and as uh, a parent of eight-year-old kids and as an author of middle grade books um, and as an actor in shows I've done the Smurfs I've done a lot of things that are for kids as well as adults and and I think that series of unfortunate events um, is as complete and respectful of kids and yet so cinematic in a way that you know, Netflix has rarely done before ever. That I, I hope it's, I hope the recognition is there for all of the creative hard work that everyone put into it. Yeah, and I mean, it certainly doesn't talk down to kids, which is what I really like. I mean, it, it, it it's sort of like a great Grimm's fairy tale, you know, in the sense of it's, it's so dark and it understands the intelligence of children. In, in uh, fact, in fact, more so it it assumes that children are more intelligent than adults in many ways, right? One of the main conceits of the show, from Daniel's books all the way through Barry's ideas uh, with, with the Netflix version, was that kids, kids are actually paying attention, and adults are so mired in their own complicated isms uh, of busyness and of work and of stresses that they can't even see something as overt as, say, Count Olaf in a ridiculous costume that they just can't be bothered and that kids are actually smart enough to be paying attention and can recognize things as they are. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Neil, thank you so much for your time and congratulations on the show and on its Emmy nominations. Uh, it was a real pleasure talking with you. Cheers. Thanks. The pleasure's all mine. Thank you. Uh, and thanks to all of you at home for watching. Make sure you click the like and subscribe buttons below and make sure you visit us at goldderby.com for all the latest Emmy news.